Welcome everyone again to the um, Character Education Program, Moral Excellence in the Workplace. Please take your seat. Um, building moral teamwork through character development. I want to play a game tonight because you know what? I like playing games. And in one of our seminars not long ago, someone said, if you are learning something new, if you're joyful when you do it, you'll learn it so much faster. So this game that I want to play is something that I played with my family when I was a teenager. And so I'm going to put up a definition. And what I'd like you to do is see if you can tell me what word that is. I used to love to like come in from the barn. We lived on a farm and I'd come in and I'd get the dictionary note and I'd find a word that I just thought no one could get. So I'm going to put this here up and I want you all to see. Can we put that first um, slide up? And as it's, oh no, no, the uh, overhead, please. Okay. It's a formal assessment or examination of something with the possibility or intention of instituting change if necessary. Anybody what, anyone want to guess what that word is? Can you shout it out? Evaluate. Evaluate, that's a great, that's a great guess. Okay, it's something we're gonna do to go back what we've already done. This is where I'd start giving them um, hints. And it starts with the R. Reveal. See, we are the most intelligent people on the face of this earth. It's amazing. So we're going to review. And when you look up that word review, it also means to relook or see again. So did you see that word possibility in there? The examination of something with the possibility. Well, that's the word choice. It's what everyone chooses to do with what is presented before them. You know, what's so really great about the peaceful solution? We never shove anything down anyone's throat. What we do is we set that table and we ask you and we invite you in to eat of this table. And when you do, we hope and our desire is that you would get the great joy of eating the food that we're eating in the peaceful solution and then making that choice to change the things that you want to change in your life according to um, the instructions. This instruction manual is so amazing. So we encourage you to partake, eat, enjoy, and really take it in as your own just like we do. So let's go back to page 97 and we have a slide, I think I should say the right word this time, slide for this one. It's called Responsibility Brings Results. And we learned that that first sentence there on page 97, everything that we use and have come to rely on in our daily lives requires that someone be responsible. And we all know that's true. That's why we all have to take our part in doing what is required of us so that it all works together. And when you're teaching that to your students, really emphasize that point that each person, when they are responsible for their part, makes everybody just as important to make the whole thing work. So in your organization, you want to really emphasize that no part is less important than the other. No person is less important than the other. And the character education that you're teaching in your workplace will make everything work smoothly because you're looking at everyone as valuable human beings. So let's look at the um, definition to be responsible. It's to fulfill all tasks to the, and, and the duties to the best of your ability. We're reading right along here in this book. This means making sure that you are doing your best to make sure that you are doing your best I think I read that twice. <laughs> to, to do your duties correctly the first time and complete them in a timely fashion. Being responsible also means being accountable. And when we are responsible to do what we're doing all day, at the end of that day, you can take an accounting. You can reassess, reevaluate. 
reveal what your day was like and you can know whether you hit the mark that day, whether you did it the way you were supposed to. But if you don't, then that's when we become accountable for our actions and we make amends. We apologize and then we make every effort to do the right thing the next time. So going on, we also learned that on page 101 that they, they had a sign up saying only responsible people need apply. And the reason that is, we, we talked about this and you really want to emphasize this, is because this is how a workplace is successful, is when everybody is responsible. Responsible to do quality work, responsible people do their best of their ability, and with teaching responsibility is with the actions, not just with words. And so we really want to emphasize that it isn't in talk. We need to walk that walk. We as the employer aren't just setting this before everyone else to eat and we go off somewhere else and have a different meal. We're, we're going to sit down with them and we're going to partake of this and learn this whole thing together. And when we realize that, you know, that our employees are, are just as important as we are, you're going to see a change. You're going to see it, the atmosphere change, and you're going to see a bond of unity built within the Peaceful Solution Character Education Program. Just like here at headquarters, we are a family, a family that encourages one another, builds that bond, and strives to overcome. Okay, so let's go, no. I want to, you all to close your books for a minute. I want you to close your books because I want you to take you to a place, a quantum universal intelligence zone. Doesn't that sound exciting? Don't you just really want to go there? Just the word intelligence makes me think, um, I'd like to go see what that's all about because you know how I am with computers and stuff, it's not quite there but I'm gonna take you to a quantum universal intelligence zone. Okay, you ready? Oh, one thing. It requires one character trait that we must have to go here. So that character trait is honesty, okay? And it's honesty with yourself, okay? Do you think we can do this? Is everybody excited? Okay, so let's see what this is all about. Let's turn to page 102, and we'll see on this overhead, it tells you what this really is, this quantum universal intelligence zone. It's a quiz. Now, if I had just told you we were gonna have a quiz, I know sometimes that's a little stressful. But as excited as you were about taking this journey to the quantum zone, um, I want you to realize that quizzes are very necessary. And this quiz isn't for you to examine your neighbor. It isn't for you to hand in a paper. This quiz is for each individual, and that's where you really stress this out as a teacher. This quiz is where each individual will look at themselves and then remember what it said when I read that other piece of paper where it said with the possibility or intention of instituting change if necessary or if willing. So it's up to each individual if they want to move forward in a more positive way using the Peaceful Solution Character Education. And when you set this before your, your employees and you're teaching them, you really want to know, let them know that when they incorporate this in, not just in our work area, not just in our organization, but it's gonna overflow to their family, to their neighbors, to their community. That community is gonna be seen by another community where your, your, your state will grow bigger, bigger in, in unity because of it. And then, who knows? We know at the, at the Peaceful Solution Character Education Headquarters, that one day, this is going to envelop the whole world. You imagine a world without war? 
Imagine a workplace without strife and envy and, and jealousy and hatred, bickering, gossip. Well, we're, we're, we're here. This is it. And this is a, a program that needs to be worked, needs to have effort put into it. But you know what? What you're going to get out of this is going to be so amazing that in weeks after starting this program, you're going to realize that everybody's changing. You're going to realize that you're thinking a little different. It's changing your heart and your mind. And every way you look at the same person that you used to be working for 20 years next to, you're seeing them in a different light. And it's, it's just amazing. So when, we, when you go over this quiz, and we're not going to go over all of it tonight. It's something that's personal. It's something that you want your employees or the ones you're teaching, you want to emphasize, take this home, take some time, and see where you are right now. And then, what's really great, when you get to the end of this book, you, can, you might want to tell them, now go back to number page 102, and where you wrote your answers on your paper today, and date your paper how you, how you did, so that when we're done with this book, or if we're going to go back over this whole book again once we get to the end, because you know what? This isn't a one-time deal. We're not into just getting the book done. We're into making changes. Then you can take that quiz again, and you can see where you're at. So no matter where you are right now, honestly, write down where you are right now. I can tell you, it says, let's read the bottom part here first without even starting, it says, so how did you do? The correct answer for all of the questions is always. More always answers indicate how responsible you are. Sometimes and never answers should be of concern to you. These are areas you need to focus on in order to become more responsible. And what's, what, what I'm what you really want to emphasize is that it's all possible. It's all very possible. There are several ways you can start developing the important trait of responsibility, regardless of the area in which you are lacking. Now, I can tell you, I can't answer always in any of those, in any of those. I will tell you, I can't answer never in any of those. I have to answer sometimes. But you know what? Where I had a never turned into a sometime. Where I had a sometime is so close to always in some of these areas. So you see, it isn't about being perfect right away. In fact, it doesn't, you might not ever get perfect in all of them, but you know what, it's the effort that you're making. And that's what you really want to emphasize to your employees, is when you see that effort being made, even if they don't quite hit the mark, you want to let them know, hey, I saw that effort that you did. That, that other person didn't respond to you quite the way that you would have probably liked them, but you, you really tried your best. And I, I appreciate that you put that effort into doing your best. When that person came in and they, uh, you, you know, that you're in a business where you're selling stuff and they're coming and buying, that customer wasn't quite very kind to you. But you know what? I saw you use great self-control. I know a couple months ago you would have lashed back at them, but you know what? You didn't do it. You didn't do it. So, you know, you made that. You're showing them that you are watching for success. Acknowledge all the efforts. Try, and this is where you can use the word never, try to never criticize the shortcomings, but always acknowledge the success. Okay, so in our sometimes, or our nevers can be sometimes, sometimes leads to always. So just let's go over a few. I led by example. I lead by example. I complete my tasks in a timely manner. I keep my desk or organized and orderly. Now, 
I can't, I don't know if I can ever answer always on that one, because you know what? If you know me, I like big messes. I really do. I get something out of, when I do a project to let it get, I don't care if it's making a cake, preparing a meal, I like a big mess. I don't know why, I just do. Because I get a great accomplishment after I see that big mess, and then the meal's almost ready and everything's cleaned up again, and then you sit down to that meal. I feel like, wow, I, I, I did some kind of amazing thing here. I, I cleaned up this huge mess. Now, I know I, not everyone is like that. My daughter's not like that. I don't know how she came from my body, but <laughs> she um, really doesn't do it like that. She is so like if she ma she's cooking and then she has her dishes and she's putting them up and it, it seems to work for her. But I, I, don't, I think one of the things I don't like is cold dishwater. And so, you know, so I do it all together and get hot water together. Well, anyway, we're all different, and that's what we really have to remind our students, our, peop our employees, is that just because someone doesn't always do it the same way, if you're, you know, if you're following the rules and you're getting the same results done and it's okay with the, the rules that is being set, then it's okay. That's where acceptance comes in. Okay, I clean up after myself. I do clean up after myself. I do my assigned duties with a positive attitude. Now, all in the, I want you to go home, and that's what you teach your, your students, your employees. I really want you to go home. I really want you to take the effort. Now, you're not, I'm not going to know if you did it or not, because I'm not grading you. This is all a choice. But you're going to be wanting to do this. So I want you to go home, and I want you to take the time. And then, even when you're taking the time and you know you have the answers, then start asking yourself, why don't I ever do my duties with a positive attitude? Why don't I never follow the rules and guidelines in my work? Why do I try to push the limit? Those are questions each of us have to answer and then see how it would be more peaceful if you made that change to where you say, I always follow the rules. I always do my assigned duties. You see what a difference? But that's where you want to really encourage them to take the time to do this quiz. Now, three of them that I think are so very, very important on this here is I readily admit when I make a mistake. I readily apologize when I am wrong. I accept correction with a humble attitude that humility can go a long, long way in your work area because, you know, we make mistakes and sometimes we didn't consider something or we didn't really take the importance of that rule. But when you're, you're being pointed out that you really, you know, veered off just a little, you know, we really want to stay on this path, then you can say, Thank you for pointing that out to me. Thank you for caring enough about me that you want me to be a better person and that you took the time to you know, let me know how to do this correctly. So now, after you're done with that test, you know, that's their thing. So let's go back over to page 99, and we're going to do procedure four. Explain to students that becoming a responsible person requires developing other character traits such as self-control and respect and then consistently di displaying them, you know, day after day, moment after moment, you know, not, oh, today I'll do it and tomorrow I won't. Consistence. Displaying them at the appropriate times. Have students read the section entitled, It's About Character and complete the activities on page 103 to 105. Discuss the answers, emphasizing that the character trait of responsibility 
is contingent or depending on other positive character traits. So with that, let's just hop right over to 103 here. And then I, I have a slide here. It, it's at the bottom of the page, but I want to show it right, right now. It's called, It Takes Character to Be Responsible. But like we just said, it also takes other <coughs> character traits to develop that character. So let's go back to the top. It's about character. Now remember, when you're doing this here book, it's like I said before, it's not about getting to a certain page, but it's about getting the words on the pages placed in the mind where it will be understood. So just as, you know, um, if you've had more than one child, you think by the first one you figured it out and you know how to teach them and they've got it down pat, the second one comes along and they don't learn the same way. It's like um, I had two that worked the way, that way. The third one was like, where did this one come from? You know, it's like I thought I had it down pat, but the third one thought a little differently. So that's where you want to keep training, keep teaching, so that you can get to all the minds. And it's not about pushing forward to hurry up and get the book done because this is a lifetime for everything. So it's about character. Did you know that to become responsible, a, a responsible person, you must develop and practice several other positive character traits? For instance, being responsible requires self-control. We all know that. It takes self-control to stop, think, and make a right choice to be responsible and respond politely to a customer who is irate or belligerent. In what other ways would practicing self-control help you to become more responsible in your work environment? You see, these are questions that each individual will have to ask themselves. And you're going to be guiding them and helping them and encouraging them to do this. It says, it says you, you, that we should really allow volunteers to offer ways of self-control that can be used to be responsible. Now, this is a discussion that you might want to have in your class, that you would encourage students to focus on themselves. Because you know what? It's so easy to see a fault in someone else, you know? But you know what? It takes courage and strength, which you will learn to have in the Peaceful Solution, to take and look at yourself and examine, evaluate, and review. Look again at yourself each day. And you know what? The more you do this, you're going to like what you see. You're going to start really liking what you see. Okay, responsibility also requires honesty. In what ways does your job require you to be honest? Whether it's counting money or returning from a break on time, being honest denotes a responsible character. How else can being honest help you to be responsible at work? And then it says list it at least three ways below. Now, that sentence says, how else can being honest? Being is an action word. You have to take action. It isn't something you just look at and it's pretty, you know, like an uh, adjective. I, I'm not great in, uh, in um, English, but I, I know a verb, verb, verb is an action word. So um, being is an action. You, know, you can't just say it. You can't just look at it on the wall and admire it. It's like it's something you actually have to do. If you want to, remember, it's all a choice. I'm not going to shove anything down your throat. I'm encouraging you to have some more of those potatoes and that gravy that I love to put on potatoes, okay? And to take that and eat it. Okay, it says, you only, you know, you only have to steal one time to be a thief. That's all. So honesty is a very important thing, and that one time might ruin your reputation. It might get you fired from your job that you worked so hard to be a part of, but you let something come into your mind and didn't cast it out. So no one might ever know that you stole. No one might ever find out. But you know you'll have that guilt. You'll have the fear that someone might find out. 
And what a horrible way to live. And we know that before the Peaceful Solution trained us to be a better person, we dealt with those things. And we are thankful that someone had this program, that Israel Hawkins made this program available. Not because he's, he, he thought he'd make a, a million dollars off of this. It's because he had the desire to build a better world. And that's the legacy that he left behind for us, is to be able to be a partaker of building this better world. And we're not here to get a million dollars either because you know what? That's not what it's about. It's just being a better person. You know, that is like the, uh, so rewarding. No money could ever take that, that place of becoming a better person, seeing and helping others to become a better person. So here's something to think about. What would you do? Now, this is a, you're not going to ask everybody to give their answers because it's what if. What would you do? And the answer has to come to you in your mind and to see and evaluate, reevaluate yourself. What would you do if you noticed that your coworker, in his haste to leave, had neglected to check all the computers and lights that they were turned off? What if he was a coworker you didn't like? Would it make a difference whether or not you tried to contact him? or another approved personnel? A responsible person would handle the situation wisely, regardless if the coworker were a friend or not. The Peaceful Solution Character edu Education Program teaches us to have a responsible attitude toward all. So, and when you, you find out, you know, you're gonna see if you're, you're that kind of person now and then you're going to see later on, as you learn this program, that you're not, if you were that person, you're certainly not that person anymore. And you know what? You've also made a friend of that person you didn't like, or at least accepted them for who they are, knowing that they're striving to be a responsible person too. So don't be a respecter of persons. Look at the real character not only of others, but the real character that you want to develop within yourself. So once again, let's put that slide back up where it says on the bottom, it takes character to be responsible. And I do thank you, and I'm so um, thankful to have the opportunity to come before um, everyone here and know that we are all striving to have that perfect character. Let us um, get ready to, for our next speaker. Thank you for your time. Hello, everyone. Okay, so we are going to continue right where our first teacher left off. And you can turn over to page 104. And we're really going into detail on the importance of the, these positive character traits. Okay, and how they all tie in with responsibility. So on page 104, at the top paragraph, it says, Another responsi a responsible person must also have self-respect, respect for others, and respect for the environment. The ability to treat others and ourselves with care and concern helps us to make choices that will not bring harm. Did you know that choosing to wear appropriate modest clothes to work shows self-respect? Okay, this is just one example of how we can show self-respect and is therefore a responsible choice? Think about it. If your outfit causes others to be distracted, are they getting their duties accomplished? Are they focused and working up to their potential? Although it may, not, although it may seem inconsequential, dressing appropriately and modestly shows that you are willing to work with the team rather than against it. How else can you use respect to make responsible choices in the workplace? Okay, and then it says list three ways on the line below, on the lines below. So as you're teaching this to your employees, really get their feedback, get them to think, you know, how can we use these positive character traits in being responsible? 
So I asked this question to our audience, and here are some of the answers that I received. So someone said, I use respect in dealing with my clients who sometimes do not respect me or the services I am providing. I use respectful communication to diffuse the situation. Okay, so, you know, that takes a lot of self-control to be able to deal with the way that those people are treating her in a respectful way and defuse that situation. Okay, here's another example someone gave. In cleaning the shelves, I knock over a very expensive hand cream and the cap cracks, exposing the contents. I know that I'm responsible for breaking it and I know the store policy requires me to take responsibility for accidents or damages. So I could choose to A, respectfully go to my supervisor and let her know what just occurred, or B, I could put it back on the shelf hoping no one will notice. After all, accidents occur, and you know maybe a customer, they won't notice that it's cracked and they'll just buy it. Okay, so there's two options there. But because I respect the owner, management, store policy, and customers, I will choose to take responsibility for the damaged item. Okay, so that would be the right thing to do, to go to the supervisor and say, you know, this was an accident, this occurred, I'm very sorry, what do I need to do to fix this? And this, you know, that's just one example. That might seem like a very small example, but it's situations like this that, you know, either make or break the atmosphere in a workplace. Okay, so let's go down to the next paragraph here. It says, being responsible also requires you to have the character trait of humility. And that word humble means not being proud or arrogant. And here it says to be humble is to put others before yourself and to be concerned with being a great example to others rather than being in charge of, being in charge of them. So even when we are placed in that authoritative position, that doesn't mean that we're the boss, we're better than everyone else, everyone else has to do exactly what we say, we're over everyone, that's not what it means. We need to treat other people the, the way that we want to be treated, and we're all still learning and growing together. You know, yes, we are the ones in authority and we give those instructions to other people, but that doesn't mean that we're better than anyone else. A humble person can accept correction without becoming offended or getting bent out of shape, okay? And remember on page 94, there was, that, there was one word that really stood out, and it was the word sincere, okay? Giving a sincere apology. So if we make a mistake, you know, accepting that correction and being sincere, giving a sincere apology and letting the person know, I'm sorry for what I did, what do I need to do so I can move on from this, so I can learn and grow from this experience? And sometimes we might think, you know, all my supervisor ever does is point out everything I do wrong. They're always telling me to fix this. They're always, you know, saying, why didn't she do it this way or this way? But, you know, if you think about it, if no one ever pointed these things out to us, how would we be able to learn and grow and move forward? We wouldn't be able to. So instead of looking at it as a negative thing, we should be very thankful that we have those people to point these things out to us, to help us, you know, to move forward and, succeed, and succeed. Okay, so continuing on here, it says, do you know someone who was fired for being insubordinate? And that word means not submitting to authority, disobedient. Okay, that's what that word insubordinate means. Being insubordinate can range from disobeying a direct request to refusing to follow established rules and policies. Although it can include a wide range of behaviors, there's one common thread, arrogance. Okay, and remember what that definition for humility was, not being proud or arrogant. So if, you know, this arrogance is pride, that's what it is. Arrogance is nothing more than a lack of humility. One of the ways we display a responsible character is to simply obey the instructions given without an attitude. 
okay? You can obey an instruction. You can do what you're told to do. But if you have a bad attitude, that's what's going to stand out way more than you following the instruction, okay? Because, you know, sometimes our authority figures, they tell us things just to see how we're going to take that instruction, how we're going, what our attitude is going to be. Are we going to have a positive attitude? Are we going to willingly do it even if we don't want to do it? That's what they're looking to see. This is a responsible choice because it helps to keep interactions in the work environment positive and productive. Okay, we've all, we've been given at least, at least one instruction that, you know, something we don't really want to do, we might not feel up to doing it, but, you know, just think about, just think, what would the workplace be like if everyone complained every time they were given an instruction that they didn't want to do? Like, can you imagine, you know, everyone just complaining and not doing what they were instructed? Nothing would be able to get done. And I'll give you an example. One of my responsibilities for the longest time has been washing dishes. And when I was younger, it's something that I really disliked doing. I didn't like washing the dishes. And sometimes I would make excuses, I would complain, and 15 minutes would go by, 30 minutes would go by, 45 minutes, an hour, and I would look and the dishes would still be there. <laughs> they weren't done. And so it took me a little bit, but after a while I realized that complaining doesn't get me anywhere. It just stretches the job out that I don't want to do and makes things take twice as long. So I realized that, okay, this is not something I really like doing. I don't really look forward to doing it. But if I just do it and get it done, then it's done with. Okay, so, you know, going back to the workplace, it would cause a lot of problems if everyone complained about everything that they were assigned to do. It would affect, you know, the time frame that things were needed to be done in. It would affect the service of the customers, and it just really ripples out from there. So at the bottom here it says, how else can a humble attitude help us to make responsible choices? I'll list a few examples on the lines below. Okay, so here are some, um, some answers I got from our audience. Having a humble attitude means that we are willing to be educated from a reputable source and getting all the facts before making a decision. Okay, that's very important, being educated and getting all the facts before making a decision. And, you know, it takes humility to say, I don't, I don't know how to do this. Can you show me how to do this? Can you educate me in how to do this? It takes humility to say that. Having done this, it would help us to make a responsible choice. Okay, another one is accepting that we may be wrong in some situations and be willing to do what is necessary to fix the problem. Okay, having a humble attitude helps us to be teachable and also considerate, which ripples out into us allowing ourselves to see, thing from, to see things from a different perspective. Let's see, another one here is, when a humble attitude is integrated in our interactions, we are likely to think things out before making irrational or impulsive decisions. We lose the attitude of always having to be right and allow room for improvement. Okay, so we, we open doors. We allow room for us to be able to improve. Okay, so on page 105... It says, a responsible person follows through on what he has been asked or instructed to do. This is because being responsible also requires us to be obedient and diligent. Okay, and I underline that. Not only obedient, but diligent in what we're asked to do. You know, if someone is counting on us to do something, they're putting their trust in us that we are going to do it right and exactly how they want it done. You know, maybe... Say, for instance, you're asked to be the last person at a work area, and you're supposed to make sure everyone's gone, the windows are closed, the lights are off, everything is put away, nothing is left out, and the doors are locked. Okay, so that's your job. Now, what would occur if, you know, you didn't follow through with that? 
and let's say maybe you thought you couldn't remember if you locked one of the doors. And instead of going and checking it, you were just like, okay, well, it's probably locked, and you left. What could be the consequences that come from that? The door could end up being, you know, it could be unlocked, and someone could break in, someone could steal, there could be damage to property, all because of not going and checking it, not following through with your responsibilities. Sometimes, you know, being diligent is double checking and making sure that we've done exactly as we've been told to do. And, you know, in a case like that, well, you'd lose trust in your supervisor because next time they told you to do that, they would have that in their mind, you know, thinking, okay, I really hope they don't forget to do this, or I really hope they don't forget to do that. So it, it would cause that lack of trust there. He also steps up to take responsibility for his actions, even if he made a mistake or caused hurt, harm, or damage. And we talked about this on the previous page. You know, again, being humble and, you know, accountable for our actions and speaking up even when we have made a mistake. And by speaking up, you know, that does help build that trust there because that person knows that even if you mess up or, you know, do something wrong, make a mistake, that you're still going to come to them and let them know what occurred so it can be fixed. So here's an example. In March 2011, there was a major earthquake and tsunami in the country of Japan. Thousands of people died or were injured, and many buildings and other structures were seriously damaged. These things included three, these included three nu nuclear plants, which overheated as a result of the damage. Okay, so basically, you know, whenever this earthquake and tsunami came, they lost electricity, so they weren't able to keep the water cool. That was, you know, they weren't able to keep these nuclear plants cool. And what occurred is they started melting and the radiation started leaking out because they overheated. And now, what were the effects? Thousands of people had to be evacuated for fear of an explosion or radiation poisoning. And the consequences of this disaster will be felt for a long time. The article below is just one example of how important it is that we are responsible for our actions and accept responsibility when things go wrong. And I underline this next sentence here. Failure to accept responsibility for our actions results in failure to learn, grow, and succeed. So not only are we hurting ourselves when we don't accept responsibility for our actions, but it also can put other people's lives at risk. We want to always keep the bigger picture in mind that our choices ripple out and affect other people. So here's the article here. It says, who's to blame for the Fukushima nuclear disaster? On who's to blame, Prime Minister Nito Kane said, needless to say, TEPCO is primarily responsible, but the state can't escape blame because it pr promoted the use of nuclear power. The Japanese government nuclear task force report acknowledged in June of 2011 that barricadic red tape and the division of responsibilities across several government agencies had hampered or held back the response of the accident. Okay, so, you know, they didn't have a backup plan for if something were to go wrong. And, you know, when something did go very wrong, they didn't move quickly and take action to see, okay, what do we need to do to fix this? And, you know, thousands of people, like it said up top, thousands of people had to be evacuated. And, you know, thousands of people lost their lives due to this whole situation that occurred. And that article is from factsanddetails.com. Okay? But, you know, the results of this one situation, you know, still affects the people that live there today. And here's another article that I just want to read quickly, author Yochi Funabashi on Fukushima crisis 10 years later, nuclear energy was and still is unforgiving. Okay, so this is from the world.org, March 8th of 2001. 10 years ago this week, a magnitude 9.0 earthquake and resulting tsunami 
struck Japan's northeastern coast, killing nearly 20,000 people and severely damaging the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. Since the meltdown at the Fukushima plant, which became one of the worst nuclear disasters in modern history, a clearer picture has emerged about large-scale mismanagement by the Japanese government and the Japanese electric utility holding company, TEPCO, that ran the plant. Yochi Funabashi, one of Japan's most eminent journalists and author of a new book titled Meltdown Inside the Fukushima Nuclear Crisis, told the world's host, Marco Werman, that there was a lack of emergency training for that critical scenario faced on March 11, 2001. Okay, so right there it says there was a lack of emergency training. They didn't have a plan, you know, a plan of action, what they should do if something were to go seriously wrong. A severe nuclear accident was unanticipated because people had a strong anti-nuclear sediment in Japan, much due to their traumatic experience of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And so operators did not want to admit that nuclear energy would have any risk. So because these people, you know, who live there were already, you know, they already had that traumatic experience of what occurred in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, they didn't want to say, you know, that they had any plan or make it look like something could possibly go wrong because these people were already fearful. So they insisted that nuclear energy was a zero-risk energy source. Funabashi said, making changes to better the safety system of nuclear plants would have been an admission that existing regula regulations and precautions were insufficient. Funabashi, whose book is based on interviews with hundreds of officials, power plant operators, and military personnel involved in the Fukushima disaster, spoke about the ongoing cleanup at Fukushima Daiichi and the lessons learned from that disaster. Okay, so here's, you know, just one example of how, you know, some actions, the actions of other people, you know, not being responsible and making sure they have a plan of action, they have these different things put in place and, you know, the consequences of what can occur from that. And, you know, Yes, we're talking about the workplace environment and, you know, thinking about our different workplace environments and the jobs that we do, it probably seems very small compared to that, you know, huge thing that we just read. But we should never underestimate the power of our choices and, you know, the effects and the consequences that they could have. Okay, so going down to the question, it says, how would not following through with your assigned tasks in the workplace affect others specifically and your work environment in general? Okay, so let's look at some answers here that we got from the audience. So the first one says, it shows you cannot be trusted and it puts a burden on others to get the job done on time on top of them having to do their own duties that are assigned to them. So not only do they have to, you know, complete the things that they already have to do, but then they have to make sure that your job is getting done too because you're not doing your job. So it puts a, it puts a huge burden on them. Um, another one is it causes a tense work environment, people wondering what duties got done, which ones didn't, and this could lead to frustration, anger, and resentment. And whenever, you know, you're frustrated, you're angry, you're upset, and you're trying to work, you can't focus on what you're trying to do. You can't focus on serving other people, helping other people, you know, teaching other people how to do different things because those emotions are going to take over your mind if that's what you're thinking on. <laughs> Another one says, the overall morale of a business, company, or department is affected. Low morale can easily result in lower productivity and a deteriorated customer service. This later can result in an unsuccessful business. When, that, when the company's business has direct contact with the public, okay, such as a healthcare system, an educational system, this can definitely result in physical harm to not just the employees, but the people that they serve. 
Okay, so it affects everyone, not just the people working in that um, workplace, but the people that they're serving. So the quote here at the bottom of the page says, a responsible person can be trusted to do as he has been asked to do. Okay, and I underline that quote, you know, that word trusted. It takes time for a person to be able to trust someone else. It takes time for that trust to be built. But, you know, when we're responsible and we do, we follow the instructions that we're given and, you know, we practice these positive character traits that, you know, we went over here, we earn that trust with the employees that we work with, with our supervisor, and they know that we're going to do what, they, what we've been assigned to do. Okay, so let's turn over, we're going to go back to the lesson plan. And on page 100, we're going to read procedure 5. It says, tell students that in addition to all our responsibilities in the workplace, we must also be responsible for the way in which we communicate with others. Okay, so as we can see here, as we've covered, we haven't even went through the whole chapter, but there are so many different aspects to responsibility. Guide class feedback by asking the following questions. So the first one we have is, why is communication important and how we fulfill our duties at work? Answers may vary, but may include that we have to work together to get the job done. And the second question, why do we need to be aware, what do we need to be aware of to make our communication effective? Okay, answers will vary, but, may, but can include our facial expressions, tone of voice, and body language. And we're going to go into detail on each one of those three things. Okay, so we know that having communication is necessary in every workplace, and now whether or not that communication is positive or negative, is effective or ineffective, is how well that workplace is going to be able to function. So on page 106, this is, you can write at the top of your page, uh, of your page this is procedure five that we're starting. You have a responsibility to communicate effectively, okay? And another word for effectively is successfully. So how can we do this? How can we learn to communicate effectively? Did you know that we have a responsibility to communicate as effectively as possible with everyone with whom we interact? This requires us to choose our words carefully and control our tone of voice and facial expressions. We do not have to make our every emotion evident to all. Being upset or frustrated should never be an excuse to communicate ineffectively. So I underline that sentence right there because there's never an excuse. You know, there's never a right reason for us to be disrespectful, for us to communicate ineffectively or negatively with anyone. There's never an okay reason to do that. When it comes to talking, it should be about quality rather than quantity. Okay, that word quality means high standard degree of excellence. And the word quantity is amount, the amount of something. So, you know, we have to learn to focus on what we're saying because what we're saying is important. <coughs> okay, so let's go into number one here. Use words effectively. It says words, words, and more words. During the course of a day, we literally say more words than we can count. Are we using the best words to describe what we feel and what we need or what we expect from others? Choosing what to say, how to say it, and when to say it in order to effectively communicate requires self-control and lots of it. Okay, so do we really, you know, it's asking us this question here. Do we take the time to think about what we say and, you know, how, how we express how we're feeling? Sometimes during our day, it's so easy to, you know, get focused on what we're doing and we're trying to get our work done. You may have a lot of things that you have to get done 
And so it can be easy to forget, you know, how we're interacting with other people. We may need something, and, you know, we say, hey, can you get that for me? But did we say, did we ask them respectfully? You know, we're in a rush, but we can't be in such a rush that we're treating people with disrespect. We always have to be mindful of what we're saying and how it comes across to other people. We often make the excuse of, it just slipped out, or I wasn't thinking, when we have said something offensive, inappropriate, or spoken out of turn. And it's very easy to make that excuse and say that, but the truth is, we didn't stop and think. We didn't practice self-control. We didn't think before we spoke. Practicing self-control enables us to stop, even if it's only for a fraction of a second, to consider what the best words to use are, or if we even need to make a comment at all. There can be wisdom in silence. Okay, I've heard this so many times. If you don't have anything nice to say, then don't say it at all. Yes, so sometimes in some situations it might be best just to, you know, walk away quietly or just not respond at all. Just listen to what they're saying and leave it at that. And that, that can help keep the peace. Now, there are some situations where, you know, if you're being asked a question, having a conversation with a supervisor, well, then you might need to respond. It might not be polite to walk away or not respond. But, you know, in that situation, then you would respond respectfully to them. One of the best ways to determine if your words are appropriate is to ask yourself the following questions. A, how would I feel if someone said this to me? Okay, that makes me think of having empathy, putting yourself in the other person, person's shoes. If someone said this to me, you know, how would I feel? If I don't like it, well, then I shouldn't do it to someone else. And B, are my words helpful or hurtful? Okay, are my words helpful or hurtful? If it's hurtful, then why would we want to say something that's hurtful to another person? That's not showing them that value and that respect that everyone deserves. At the bottom it says, if you decide, if you decide that you would not want such words spoken to you and that they are hurtful, then do not say them to someone else. Choose different words that would better communicate your needs in an appropriate and harmless way. This is one way of building responsible communication. Okay, so we want to choose words that would help build each other up. Okay, that would help, you know, us communicate appropriately, have peace in the workplace, and have a peaceful work environment. And I like this quote at the bottom. It says, chew up your words before you spit them out. Okay, and I, put, I wrote right under that, stop and think before you speak. Okay, so we are going to end right here in our class tonight. I want to thank you all for coming and for all of your participation. I hope you all enjoyed class. And with this, we are going to end. Have a great evening, everyone.